is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Juliet Mann. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. Oil prices rise after Saudi Arabia pledges to slash output by a million barrels a day. Label your deep fakes or face fines. The EU tells tech companies to signpost AI content to clamp down on disinformation. Claims and counterclaims. Russia says Ukraine's counteroffensive has begun as both sides talk up battlefield gains. And tackling plastic pollution, how one social enterprise in Brazil is handling waste one bottle at a time. Oil prices are higher after a decision by Saudi Arabia to cut production by a million barrels a day from July. Other major oil-producing nations will extend earlier cuts through to the end of 2024. It follows talks in Vienna between the OPEC Plus group of nations, which includes Russia. Oil prices have fallen for the last 10 months due to weak economic growth. Saudi Arabia's energy minister described the decision as a sweetener. As we have done in April, whereby uh, the countries that had uh, agreed to uh, do the voluntary cuts, uh, have extended that voluntary cuts to end of 24. And uh, I would have to call it the Saudi lollipop, which is a million barrel of reduction uh, for the start that starts at the 1st of July. And it, that million is also extendable. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, John Terrett, who's in New York. Um, John, what, what's the reaction to these production yeah. cuts where you are? Uh, well, I think anger and irritation, quite frankly. Anything to do with the Middle East, anything to do with the Saudis, anything to do with OPEC Plus and oil prices immediately produces a big pushback in the American media, and so it is today. The story broke yesterday, Sunday. It's still running as one of the major headlines in all the news programs here this morning on Monday morning. And basically, Saudi, along with the OPEC, others, is slashing the oil supply by a lot of barrels, as you just heard. In other words, it is sending much less, or planning to, if and when this starts in July, planning to send a lot less of its oil out to the world market than we have at the moment. And as you know, that is inflationary and will drive up prices. So why is Saudi doing this? Well, Saudi is somewhat emboldened at the moment, quite frankly, because we also learned over the weekend, to everyone's jaw-dropping surprise, that the Saudis are now getting into bed with the Iranians, where they're going to share naval duties in the Gulf. And this sort of rapprochement between the two countries, which have traditionally not liked each other very much, and that's an understatement, extends really to all the Gulf countries. As you know, Saudi and uh, Qatar are the two dominant, I think, Gulf countries. Well, Saudi is taking the lead here with Iran. And beyond the naval cooperation that we heard about at the weekend, it also involves Iran opening an embassy and various sort of missions and stuff like that in Saudi Arabia once again. Now, the U.S. says of this deal over the weekend, this just defies reason. And the reason it defies reason is because, as I said, the two countries really dislike each other. And they've been mm -hmm. fighting a proxy war, basically West versus East, essentially, in Yemen over the last handful of years, as you well know. So Saudi is emboldened, and here they are cutting a million barrels of oil per day. Okay, now to put that into context, this is the third time they've done this. So this now brings their cuts in the last year to four million barrels a day. This is Saudi and other OPEC members, you understand. It'll start in July. And that is one year since President Biden went to visit MBS, who is the Saudi ruler, and essentially begged him not to do this. The White House wouldn't couch it in those terms, but I will, and everybody else here does. They essentially had President Biden begging the Saudis not to cut oil in order to stop inflation getting even worse here. Well, the Saudis have clearly ignored that completely. And basically, the news from here is that Americans are now being told to expect much higher what they call gas prices, everyone else calls petrol prices 
in the driving season, the holiday summer season, which is getting underway right now. And of course, just at the time that oil prices, gas prices, petrol prices begin to stabilize at the pumps here after this inflationary season that we've all just lived through. The Saudis say, well, look, you know, it's our product. We have to protect it. It's as simple as that. And WTI, which is West Texas Intermediate, which is the benchmark oil here in Texas, is up 1.2 percent now, but actually from a fairly low level, only 72, 62, and in the course of the last year we've seen it much higher. Juliet and Robin. Okay, so oil prices, um, petrol pumps, gas pumps, that's going to be in, in the news for a while, but there's also some, some corporate um, stories this week. Apple's big week kicking off. Yes. Yeah, I should just say, by the way, it's important to understand, in America, the holiday driving season is a very big deal. It's the time when people get in their cars and they drive from state to state to state on the holiday to save the airfare. And as you know, you have to fly everywhere in America, and this is going to drive up airfares as well. So that's why it's a very significant story coming at this mm. time, the beginning of June. But yeah, the big corporate story of the day is Apple. Now, Apple is one of those very rare companies. In fact, I can't even think of another one that has a fan club. I mean, seriously, these people, they love Apple. They love their products. They can't wait to find out what Apple is going to do next in terms of software and hardware. And today in Cupertino, California, where Apple is based in big headquarters, they are going to begin their worldwide developers conference. Now, this happens every year. Basically, it's a chance to set out what they plan to do in terms of new software and hardware. And people just love it. And they'll be tuning in virtually and going in person. And the headline is we're expecting a new headset. And this headset will Will combine the real world with virtual reality. It's going to cost about $3,000, so I won't be buying one, that's for sure. You won't get a hold of it till December. That's when it will be available. They're only making 900,000 of them. Compare that to 200 million iPhones. So not a lot, but they're dipping their toe in the water here, this virtual reality sort of metaverse world that we're told is coming. Apple is a $3 trillion company these days, and the shares are up 1.7% right now at record levels. Juliet and Robert. Wow. John Terrett, thanks so much. I'll speak to you later in the week. Thank you. John Terrett in New York. Well, let's go back now to the news of Saudi Arabia cutting oil production and other OPEC member countries extending existing cuts. Let's talk to Christoph Ruhl, who's from the Centre on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Uh, good to speak to you, Christoph. So uh, what's behind this decision um, from the OPEC Plus group to uh, extend the existing output cuts uh, into next year? Good afternoon. I'm sorry, but I have to take a little bit issue with your man in New York here. I don't think there's any kind of big conspiracy theory, much less one between Iran and Saudi Arabia against the U.S. behind that decision. What is behind that decision is an oil price, which has declined a lot and uh, which was sort of running at $120 when Russia invaded Ukraine and everybody was worried. And which, uh, before this decision was made, was down below 70. And Saudi Arabia has a lot of big projects which they want to do for better or worse and with big white elephants some people say but uh, they do need an oil price in the 80s uh, or at least above 80 to not have a budget uh, deficit and what's behind this decision is, is frankly only the attempt what they call stabilization which in reality is just the attempt to keep the oil price above that threshold uh, i think that's the brief of the minister there so Saudi Arabia uh, rather went their own way on this one, didn't they, uh, cutting production. Uh, how will this decision have gone down uh, within OPEC, within those other member countries? Well, this is correct. You, know, you have to step back a little bit to see the full complexity of the problem. It's a really tricky situation for most of these producers involved. In the short term, there is this question, especially for Saudi Arabia, how do we get the oil price? How so do we stop it from falling? If all indications in the market are that it is further under pressure, if we don't do anything, that's where the cut comes from. But in the medium term, they have to get their own house in order, meaning OPEC, not OPEC plus, but OPEC, the old members of the oil production cartel, because they operate on production quotas, and these production quotas are terribly dated. So you have a bunch of African countries who cannot even produce as much as they're allowed under the current quota system, simply because they haven't invested for a long time in their production capacity has gone down. And then you have other countries, most notably the United Arab Emirates, the neighbor 
the rich neighbor of Saudi Arabia and the Middle East who have added capacity, and they are way below what they actually could produce. And so a year ago, so they almost threatened to leave OPEC. They said, we need a higher quota. So the quotas, the baselines, need to be rearranged. That's the second step. And then the third very long-term proposition, of course, is what is going to happen to this hybrid organization? We have here OPEC, the old members of oil-producing countries, and then we have the PLUS, which is Russia and uh, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, a lot of countries in the vicinity of the former Soviet Union. Is this going to be become one organization, or are they going to work together or together sometimes? And so all these things had to be settled. And mm. what happened here is that they did rearrange the quotas, at least for 24, which is one step in making some final decisions. And what uh, the oil minister of Saudi Arabia called his lollipop or his sweetener was that they then did this, un 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 uh, this cut only of Saudi Arabia, this voluntary cut, sparing further cuts to all these countries who had to reduce their quotas, even though they didn't really like it. Mm. That was uh, his lollipop, and that's what, what this court referred to. So they did the short-term thing they cut, and only Saudi is bearing the cost of that. And they did start the medium-term thing to rearrange their quotas. On the longer-term thing, I think a lot will happen what happens in Ukraine. So I wanted to ask you about, about the oil price. Obviously, it's designed to push up the price of that. We have seen that happen. Uh, will this keep them higher, though? And, um, and what does that mean for people like you and me, people uh, buying petrol at the pump? It probably will put a hold on it. Whether it will work or not depends on the extent to which these cuts are really implemented. I have no doubts the Saudis will implement the cuts, but if they do it only for one month, that translates into 100,000 barrels per day for the whole year, which is how these things are usually measured. So it's not very much. Um, but even if they sustain it, it depends what other countries do, Iran, Venezuela, Guyana, Brazil, who all have, and, and not least the U.S., who have, who have the potential to produce more. And what has happened already is that uh, high oil prices for a while after the Russian invasion were uh, an, an inducement to reduce demand among, among many customers. So to see the problem the Saudis are facing if they continue going it alone, you have to just look back to the 1980s after the oil price shocks. Oil prices fell into their 20s in Saudi Arabia frantically cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting, trying to bring them back against falling global demand until in the mid late 80s they finally gave up and just swamped the market. And then it took until the early 2000s until, until they came back. And now we are very Similar situation, global economy not in good shape, you know, Fed raising interest rates again, the Saudis going it alone, cutting, 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 because nobody else really wants to join. The other countries are happy with the way they are. And the question is, can they stop the decline? My best guess is they will be able to stop the decline if we don't see a major economic recession. Okay, Christoph Rule from Columbia University. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us today. Oh, my pleasure. Tech giants, including Google and Facebook, are being urged by the European Union to immediately start labelling content and images generated by artificial intelligence. It's part of the EU's ongoing efforts to tackle fake news and disinformation as concerns mount over the potential abuse of AI technology. Well, our correspondent Alex Cadier is in Brussels. Uh, so, Alex, how likely are these tech companies, these platforms, uh, to comply with this? Well, at the moment, it's just a voluntary basis. The uh, Code of Practice on Disinformation has been uh, in existence for a few years now. It involves really a lot of the major tech giants, uh, Facebook or Meta, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp and others, uh, Google, Snap and big companies like that. It used to uh, involve Twitter. Elon Musk has decided to pull Twitter out of that code of practice on disinformation, that voluntary organization. But it doesn't just uh, include those tech platforms. It also includes uh, civil society and nonprofits, including uh, most recently uh, a, a, a nonprofit uh, called AI Forensics, which actually investigates the impact of AI, the impacts of algorithm. That gives you a sense of the kind of forum that the EU is trying to create here. And as you said, quite rightly, the main priority, or one of the priorities that uh, the EU put forward was labeling AI content. To give you an example, just in the last few, uh, a few hours, actually, there was a video that circulated on social media, a fake AI-generated video of Vladimir Putin uh, uh, claiming to call for another mobilization of Russian uh, civilians for uh, the operation in uh, Ukraine. That is an example of AI-generated content which could have serious ramifications. Uh, a few months ago, we saw a photo, for example, of the Pope wearing a very expensive white puffer jacket, also AI-generated and fake. And what the European Commission is asking these platforms to do voluntarily is put a label on that to let users know that what they're seeing is not generated by people uh, 
Vera Jourova, the Commissioner and the Transparency Commissioner, uh, spoke about this a little bit earlier today. Let's have a listen to what she said. Uh, we want the platforms to label the production of AI in the way which the normal user, who is also distracted by many different things, but normal user will clearly see that this is not the text uh, or the visual uh, produced, uh, developed, created by real people. This is the robot speaking. So as you can see there, uh, a real clear label required, or at least asked of those tech platforms. But at the moment, it really is up to them whether or not they comply. We've seen Twitter, that big example, uh, pulling out of the code of practice on disinformation. It's been a, a signatory to that code of practice for years, deciding it has no desire to be part of it anymore. And Vera Jourova, that commissioner you just saw, says, well, Twitter chose the difficult path and chose confrontation. So we'll have to see over time whether or not the platforms decide to comply to this request. So uh, a voluntary code, uh, the EU, as things stand, doesn't seem to have a lot of power. Well, if you focus just on the code of practice of, on, on disinformation, it is a voluntary basis, as I said, and so it does uh, really seem like the EU asking for a favour or asking quite nicely for these uh, uh, multi-billion dollar companies to comply to uh, something if they ask nicely. Now, that does seem a little toothless if you look at it on the, uh, on the surface. Certainly, the code of practice has had some criticism about that. But in a few months' time, about actually a few months' time, I should say, a 10 days' time, the requirements of the Digital Services Act for those very large platforms will kick in. And so this code of practice, among other things, will become a code of conduct, which is enshrined in European law. These big platforms will have to start taking a very serious action when it comes to disinformation uh, by law. They will be able to have... Uh, a request from the European Commission, the European Union, on uh, content that is seen as problematic or, or uh, damaging to democratic values or dam damaging to uh, the European public. So for now, a voluntary basis, but in a matter of days, it's going to be much more serious as the Digital Service that Services Act kicks in. Alex, thank you very much. Our correspondent, Alex Cadier in Brussels. Switzerland's biggest lender, UBS, expects to complete its takeover of Credit Suisse as early as next week, creating a mega bank with a balance sheet of $1.6 trillion. The bank will have a workforce of 120,000 people worldwide, although it has announced job cuts to reduce costs. And it's not yet clear what will happen to the Swiss retail arm of Credit Suisse, long seen as the group's crown jewel. Airlines around the world expect to make nearly $10 billion this year as the industry bounces back from the COVID pandemic. The International Air Transport Association has doubled its profit forecast for the year despite the looming economic slowdown. IATA says the higher forecast is down to cargo revenues, China's reopening and lower jet fuel prices. Britain remains the top European destination for foreign direct investment in financial services, despite the uncertainties caused by Brexit. That's according to a recent survey by consultancy EY. It found that the UK had attracted 76 financial services projects last year, up 17% from 2021. Britain was followed in the rankings by France, Spain and Germany. The first trial of a universal basic income in England could be given a green light. Researchers want financial backing for a two-year trial that would see 30 people paid nearly $2,000 a month without conditions. Their mental and physical health would then be monitored. Supporters say that basic income schemes can simplify welfare systems and tackle poverty. Still to come on CGTN, trains are running again in eastern India as an official investigation is launched into the country's worst rail disaster in 20 years. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? and unicorn companies. Make sense of it all with global business, only on CGTS. There's a new agenda for a new world, accelerating change in almost every part of our lives. It's shifting the norms of how we work, travel, and connect. How we think, 
interact and develop. It's a new reality, a new agenda with me, Juliet Mann. Welcome back. Russia claims it has thwarted a large-scale Ukrainian attack in the southeastern region of Donetsk. But Ukraine's armed forces have not confirmed if they've started their long-awaited counter-offensive. Our correspondent Yero Abdafid reports. Russia's defense ministry has released pictures that it claims show Ukraine launching a major attack. It also says that fighting is continuing on Monday. Russia's claims cannot be independently verified, but the images appear to show vehicles coming under fire. Ukraine's response to what it describes as Moscow misinformation is to keep quiet. It has released its own video showing its soldiers calling for silence before going into battle. There is pressure on Ukraine to show its army is ready to attack and how newly donated Western weapons may make a difference. If you're Ukraine and you know you've got to mount this offensive, you are trying to increase the chances of surprise about when you do it, where you do it and how you do it. So they're going to do two things. They're, they're going to sow disinformation, Ukraine, about you know, when, when and how. So the conversation about we haven't got enough stuff is pretty much true, but it's also sowing a sense that, well, this won't come for a while. So far, Ukraine's military hasn't confirmed it started its offensive. It says it is still fighting in the destroyed city of Bakhmut. The outspoken leader of a Russian mercenary group admits one area has been retaken by Ukrainian soldiers. Yevgeny Prigozhin says a part of the Berkivka settlement has already been lost and that Russian troops are running away. He calls it a disgrace. For months, Ukraine's President Zelensky has requested more weapons, ammunition and warplanes to use against Russian forces. On Sunday, the US government once again warned against using its military hardware outside of what is regarded internationally as sovereign Ukrainian territory. The use of our equipment uh, in, uh, for, for offensive operations in Russia, we certainly would uh, discourage that. Maintain the stance that the equipment that we provide or is, is for use in their defense of their sovereign territory. There are concerns that recent attacks in Russia involves Ukrainians. Pro-Ukrainian Russian fighters have claimed responsibility for several cross-border attacks inside Russia. This video was released by the Freedom of Russia Legion. Moscow says two civilians were killed during the attacks. Yolo Abdavid, CGTN. Let's speak to our correspondent, Stuart Smith, in Moscow. Um, Stuart, what's the latest from the Kremlin? So as summed up the events of Sunday going into Monday when it says a large-scale counter-offensive took place, which is implying is the counter-offensive that we have been waiting for. Having said that, the Russian Defense Ministry is very clear that it believes all of the tasks the Ukrainian armed forces were trying to achieve uh, throughout Sunday were not completed. It's characterized this as no success for Ukraine. It says as part of that, it killed around 300 Ukrainian soldiers in the vicinity of South uh, southwest Donetsk, where the counteroffensive happened, elsewhere in the country, around 400. So it's alleging massive losses for the Ukrainian armed forces because of this. It also says it's still dealing with potential incursion attempts being made around the Belgorod region, uh, which is forcing people in that region to flee. The current count is 4,000 Belgorod residents in temporary accommodation. Local officials are urging more to leave as there continues to be shelling within Russian territory and continues to be that threat of anti-Kremlin Ukrainian-based forces trying to enter the country. 
And Stuart, Russia's started drills, drills in the, Black, in the Baltic Sea. Yeah, that's right. One day after NATO began its drills, Russia is also sending out its fleet to try to, uh, as it put it, practice combat uh, readiness and military command. It says that in the Baltic, 40 ships will be taking part in these drills, 25 helicopters and aircraft and 3,500 personnel. But also on the same, at the same time on Monday, right across on the other side of Russia in the Pacific, there are also naval drills taking place, even more ships there. They claim 60 at the Russian Ministry of Defense, vessels taking uh, to the seas there. All part of training, the Russian Ministry of Defense says, that was already planned but particularly controversial for the Japanese in the Pacific as they have disputes with Russia over islands and of course in the Baltics where now most, me most members, most countries straddling the Baltic are part of NATO, a show of force from Russia and also potentially for Russia uh, these forces may one day have to be used as Russia does believe that NATO poses an existential threat to Moscow. Stuart Smith in Moscow, thank you very much. India has launched an official investigation into its deadliest rail crash in over two decades after preliminary findings pointed to signal failure. Trains are now running again in the eastern district of Balasore after Friday's high-speed collision. Officials say that around 100 victims have yet to be identified. At least 275 people were killed when a passenger service hit a stationary freight train before being struck by an oncoming express. Over 1,000 people were injured. Our correspondent Ravinda Bawa has more from Odisha State. Reservation is now becoming a challenge also because the temperatures here in Odisha are quite high, it's humid, so it's difficult to preserve them. What the protocol says uh, that the government will wait for 96 hours and the deadline for that has, uh, will be finishing tomorrow, that is Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the evening at the time of the accident. Only then there will be a decision made by the government whether there will be a mass cremation. In the meantime, what the authorities are doing, that all these bodies which have not been identified as yet, and it is difficult because most of them are disfigured, there are some body parts and the whole body is not intact, so it is becoming difficult to identify. In those cases, the DNA sampling is being done so that later if claimants come, the DNA sample will be matched with the family members and then uh, all the compensation procedures will be followed accordingly uh, as the administration has laid down. So all these challenges are there but at the same time arrangements are being made to hand over the body to the families and ambulances have been arranged for each body to be sent uh, back with the family to their respective homes and villages wherever they are. So all this is going on. It is a, a cri time of crisis for all the health workers as well as the administration because they are here 24 hours while the trauma and the tragedy for the families is very serious because in the sense that they are running from one hospital to the other finally to find their loved one in a mortuary is a torturous experience and we have seen that in the last few days being here outside this mortuary. Honduras has appointed its first ambassador to China. The two countries established diplomatic ties in March after the Central American nation broke off relations with Taiwan. Our correspondent Li Zhuanghua spoke to the foreign minister of Honduras and asked him what Hondurans think about the country's ties with China. This starting of relation has been very positive for, for Honduras because uh, I think uh, the Honduran people uh, understand the, the important role in China in the international uh, field and also culturally uh, we will have uh, a new approach for the relations with China. Uh, on, on the agreements that we expect to, to sign with uh, our Chinese counterpart, it will be very important to add these possibilities related to uh, one, to cultural exchange, uh, so the Honduran people can learn more about the Chinese history and culture and, the, and their contribution to the, to, the, to, the, to the world. And also, China could understand and learn about the Honduran culture uh, and history. Uh, I think it will be a very important link uh, for t uh, two countries in a very uh, uh, separate uh, continents that can join and, and, and work together. And how do you see the comments that Central America and the Caribbean is the backyard of the United States? And do you think that China is boosting its influence in that region? Well, I think uh, Latin America has changed over the years in Central America and the Caribbean. Unfortunately, yes, we cannot deny that in the uh, past, in the 
20th century and at the end of the 19th century, uh, unfortunately, the countries in the region has uh, been uh, playing a role uh, that is directed to the influence and, and, and intervention of uh, former U.S. Uh, governments. But I think uh, Latin America has changed over these year, years. In particular, the government of President Castro is, is seeking to improve uh, and to respect uh, that the Honduras has, is respected in their sovereignty, their internal decision, the autodetermination of the Honduran people. And I think uh, this will be the, the pathway to, to development. And, and these uh, principles are respected by China. And looking ahead, what are the future prospects for the Honduras-China relationship? And what steps is Honduras taking to enhance cooperation in the coming years? Are we looking at some new projects? Yes, indeed. I think we have uh, 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 certain priorities uh, that are directed to develop new possibilities for the Honduran people. Uh, fighting poverty, fighting against exclusion, uh, fighting for the equality of the Honduran people, and, and fighting many problems that we have faced in, in historically. And I think China, as I mentioned, uh, will prove uh, a very important role in developing new possibilities, uh, new possibilities for enhancing the Honduran economy, enhancing its development, and also the capabilities of finding new infrastructural uh, projects that can change this reality, mainly in the issues of transport, ports, and, and energy. You can get highlights from the week's news in Europe and China direct to your inbox from CGTN's storyboard email newsletter. Sign up at europe.cgtn.com slash newsletter. You're watching CGTN. Still to come, rich countries accused of broken promises over money to help poorer nations cope with climate change. perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing, and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. What do we mean when we talk about the difference? The brazen acts. The difference is in the detail, in the background, defense ministers from the wider angle and perspective of every story, wherever the story may be. CGTN, see the difference. Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Robin Dwyer and me, Juliet Mann. The headlines again. 
Oil prices rise after Saudi Arabia pledges to slash output by a million barrels a day. Label your deep fakes or face fines. The EU tells tech companies to signpost AI content to clamp down on disinformation. Claims and counterclaims. Russia says Ukraine's counteroffensive has begun as both sides talk up battlefield games. Turkey's new finance minister has pledged a return to rational economic policy. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan named former economy chief Mehmet Shimshek treasury and finance minister as part of the cabinet for his new five-year term. Shimshek's appointment could mark a departure from years of unorthodox policies under Erdogan, which have included sticking to low interest rates despite high inflation and heavy state control of markets. Well, Timothy Ash is an economist at Blue Bay Asset Management. Uh, welcome to the program, Timothy. So uh, we're seeing that Mehmet Shimshek has signaled a change in Turkish economic policy, uh, a return to rational economic policy, he says. Uh, what could that look like? Well, ultimately, it means higher policy rates. <clears throat> Erdogan has run a, an economy on, on hot in an electoral cycle. Growth has been too high, which has pumped inflation. Uh, higher and also pumped import growth, which has meant a higher current account and trade deficit, which feeds into a weaker currency and then back into inflation. So the economy needs slowing, needs higher rates, probably tighter fiscal policy also. I mean, this is a, a fine line to tread, a difficult line to tread, isn't it? Because President Erdogan has said that he will stick with the policies from his last term. So how significant uh, would a move away from those be? Well, you're right. I mean, Erdogan has certainly banged the unorthodox policy agenda, the idea that high interest rates cause inflation from an economics perspective. That's gobbledygook. That's not reality. Um, and But I think, you know, he he, he could argue that uh, he ran in the election campaign on, on that agenda. Uh, he won the election, so he's been vindicated to a degree. He now has a lot of political capital, though, and I think the reality is those around him will be telling him that, uh, you know, continuing this policy uh, risks pushing the Turkish economy over a cliff of maxi devaluation and then potential systemic problems, particularly in the banks. So I think, you know, he, he won the election, he, he ran this policy in the run-up election, and he won the election on the back of the policies. Now I think he, the economic reality is kind of hitting him and he needs to tighten policy. And I think hiring Shimshek and likely changes at the central bank, we'll see an orthodox policy. Uh, you know, uh, Shimshek talks about rational it's another word for orthodoxy, which means higher rates. And President Erdogan's uh, economic policies uh, from the previous term obviously led to soaring inflation, a crash in, in the lira, the currency. Uh, does Turkey need this to change? Well, it does. I mean, reserves, you know, they, they, apparently they blew something like 25 billion in reserves defending the currency. In the run-up to the elections, the central bank's currency reserve chest is pretty bare at the moment. Net international reserves are probably significantly negative. They just can't sustain this any longer. Uh, they have to let the currency find its own level. Obviously, weak currency passes through to inflation. You know, you have to respond to that higher inflation with higher rates of slow growth to, to kind of uh, moderate inflation. So I think there's no choice. And the risk of continuing these policies is of this maxi devaluation cycle and then people lose confidence fundamentally in money and the banks and there's a danger then of run on banks and the collapse of the banking system going back to the period 2000 2001 where turkey had the last banking crisis so i think they have to act now um, there's no alternative uh, erdogan can recognize that i guess with the appointment of shimsha timothy uh, good to talk to you thanks for joining us today that's uh, timothy ash My from pleasure. blue bay asset management the head of the UN nuclear watchdog, Rafael Grossi, says Iran is only cooperating with a fraction of its commitments under an inspection deal agreed in March. Our correspondent, Johannes Pleschberger, says that while Grossi had some positive comments for Tehran, concern is growing over increasing stocks of enriched uranium. A few months ago, Iran and the IEA actually found an agreement on how to continue and develop the monitoring program of Iran's uh, nuclear program. But according to Director General Rafael Grossi, only a few cameras have been installed, and this is only a fraction of what pa both parties, according to him, agreed on. Uh, let's listen to what Rafael Grossi said earlier today. After my uh, visit to Tehran, 
uh, in uh, early March, a joint statement was uh, agreed, and we have been starting the implementation of it. Some progress has been made, but not at the level, pace, and sustained a rhythm that I would expect. The inventory of a rich uranium is growing at a very uh, fast uh, pace and the activities are also growing. So what is interesting though is that just a few days ago the IEA said that the Iran has given a satisfactory answer regarding the uranium particles they found at one of the three sites in Iran um, and uh, the uh, Israeli president Netanyahu uh, responded that those are lies that uh, the IA should not believe Iran and that the IA is actually uh, capitulating uh, towards the pressure um, um, done by Iran. Now Grossi responded to uh, those concerns saying that uh, the IA is used to, these, uh, to this criticism and that those, the answer the, uh, the, which Iran has provided is plausible but not impossible. And Johannes, there's also been uh, some discussion about the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, hasn't there? So Rafael Grossi said today that there is a major support for his safety plan for Europe's biggest nuclear power plant, which is in Ukraine, and where heavy fighting around this plant is going on. And actually, a few days ago, the uh, Russian atomic energy agency Rosatom said that Russia is following this plan. Although the IEA said that uh, risks have risen in the past months, offside power was knocked off about seven times. Beat plastic pollution, the theme for this year's World Environment Day. Plastic's a major problem everywhere, but it's particularly visible in some developing nations. In Brazil, a new initiative called Plastic Bank offers financial incentives for recycling. Our correspondent Lucretia Franca reports. Two hours from Rio de Janeiro in the coastal city of Itaguaí, collecting discarded plastic has become an important source of income for these waste pickers. Picking up plastic is great now because I get paid a bonus for it. The more I collect, the more money I make, and it's helping me pay bills, food and medicine. This is a result of a new model of social commerce being introduced by a company called Plastic Bank, a Canadian-based social enterprise. The process is straightforward. Locals are financially incentivized to pick up plastic and take it to a recycling center, which then resells it to partners committed to sustainable development. So, the idea is to stop plastic ending up in the ocean and help those in need through a circular ecosystem that involves customers and companies that buy what we call our social plastic at a premium to be reused in new products. A key component of the business is the company's use of blockchain technology and a special app that tracks and ensures the secure and fair payment of waste collectors. And perhaps one of the initiative's most important impacts is that waste pickers here are now viewing plastic not as trash, but rather as a valuable resource. Rosa Carvalho, a recycling center manager, says it's a win-for-all solution in the city. Plastic doesn't go to the sea, rivers, manholes or sewers, and the city is always clean because it is all recycled. Well, over 3,500 waste pickers in Brazil are now involved in the project. Environmentalists say that one core problem remains. Recycling is still much more expensive than producing new plastic. Lucrecia Franco, CGTN, Rio de Janeiro. A new report shows rich nations are giving just a fraction of the money promised to poorer countries to help them adapt and cope with climate change. Now, back in 2009, developed countries pledged to give around $100 billion a year to developing nations from 2020. It's a so-called climate financing, but that goal has so far not been met, with developed nations claiming $83 billion were provided in 2020. However, the charity Oxfam believes that the actual amount of financing 
was at most $24.5 billion, less than a quarter of what was promised. Jacobo Ocharan is the international lead for climate justice at the charity Oxfam. Thanks for coming on the program. Let's, let's start by getting these numbers clear because the $100 billion pledge was agreed in 2009, ratified in 2015 in Paris, and in no subsequent year has that amount actually been spent. Is that correct? That's exactly it, Juliet. Uh, we haven't reached even on the, on the report that the countries are saying, as you say, very right. It's, uh, it's over 80 million, but when you go to the details of the finance, that it needs to be in form of grants, that it, gives, that it needs to, give, to be money given by, by rich countries to impoverished countries, uh, this is something that is not happening. Why? Because the countries are not making additional money or are giving money in forms of loans, money that it needs to be a return, uh, you know, uh, after a while. So actually, this is, uh, you know, when we made the correct counting, which, by the way, is very difficult because there is no clear uh, rules on accountability of this climate finance. But when we make with a lot of detail the counting, we have that figure that at the most is 24 billion. So you're counting it one way. The richer countries are counting it another way. You know, they're saying that in 2020, actually, they spent 83.3 billion dollars. The value you're giving is way lower than that. Exactly, because as I said, uh, you know, what the countries are counting there, it's, uh, it's money that is not clearly and, uh, as it was defined in the Paris Agreement. The money defined uh, in the Paris Agreement, it was based on countries accepting the responsibilities of the crisis, of which countries accepting re the uh, responsibility of the crisis that they are creating, and, uh, and uh, it needs to, give, uh, needs to be given in force of grants. What countries are putting there in that counting to reach uh, 84 million is, is, as I say, money that it needs to be returned later, later on by the poor countries. We're not doubting that there is a climate crisis, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. And I, I wonder how much all of the recent um, global economic stress from you know, soaring inflation to the cost of living crisis plays into those numbers. Of course, uh, countries are, are, are uh, you know, uh, claiming all kinds of excuses of saying why they are not uh, 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 granting this money, but uh, remember that this uh, that this is uh, agreement. It comes uh, it comes for the long term, uh, and it comes actually way beyond this crisis. Uh, and we saw it very recently with the with the COVID. I mean, when when there is, uh, I will say, uh, uh, an interest to 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 find the money, the money is there. So of course there is a lot of of of, of issues playing, but but uh, there is still no this sense of collective responsibility for this crisis. And this crisis is serious. This crisis is generating um, a drought of 40 million people uh, this year in, in East Africa. It's generating a, a lot of suffering around the world. And is this, there is still no distance of collective responsibility for this crisis. You, you talk about this collective responsibility. So, so how does climate financing need to change if we're going to hit or get anywhere near those global targets? Of course, the, 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 the climate finance, it was very clearly defined for a series of, of things. One of them is for adaptation, which, by the way, is very short. When we put these figures, the adaptation, the money for adaptation is even less than it was promised, even, you know, in percentage. Uh, adaptation means that, that people and impoverished people and countries can adapt to the existing consequences. Now, for instance, we are claiming, and it's, it's you know, uh, poor countries, it's not just Oxfam, it's plenty of of uh, you know, uh, island states and countries that, that they are going through this crisis, they are asking money for loss and damage. That means that, that, that they need money to face with the existing effects of climate uh, crisis. As I say, droughts, floods, and all kinds of, of, of disasters that, that they are driving people to hunger and to, and, to, and to death in many cases. Be interesting to see what they come up with at the uh, Bonn Climate Conference. Jacobo O'Karen, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Still ahead on Global Business Europe. Saving a species, one woman's decades-long mission to protect Uganda's mountain gorillas. Events have consequences. Words create impact. Unprecedented scenes that we saw. Hello, the cleanup operation is now well and truly underway. Parts of southern Europe remain in a state of emergency. Context gives meaning. People make history.
far more than a thousand people have come here today. But authorities are still on high alert. So into the attention of world leaders. A complex world demands a comprehensive view. But with the cleanup efforts more or less under control. The economic impact is bound to ripple across the country. There's plastic pollution everywhere. Because the world today matters for your world tomorrow. This is the living area of the crew. And in these mountains, they recently finished building a power plant. Well, this is something completely different. The World Today, every day on CGTN. Welcome back. Now, it's World Environment Day, and one conservationist is hoping her mission to protect wildlife will continue to make a difference. Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoko was Uganda's first wildlife veterinary officer and has dedicated her life to saving endangered mountain gorillas. CGTN's Paul Barber has been talking to her. Dr. Gladys Kalema Zika Soka is back in familiar territory, London's Royal Veterinary College, where she studied in the mid 1990s, honing a vocation that would take her back home to Uganda to embark on a lifelong mission to save a species. And when I worked with the mountain gorillas, I felt that I wanted to be a vet, a full time wildlife vet, because seeing how few gorillas were remaining and looking at the threats, you know, that's all around I could see a hard edge. People are surrounding gorillas and we could easily make them sick. And I felt like I wanted to become a full-time wildlife vet. And that's what she did, becoming the first ever veterinary officer of the Ugandan Wildlife Authority when she was 25. At the time, gorillas in the Bwindi National Park numbered around 300, whereas now there are nearly 500, with at least 600 in neighboring Varinga National Park, eight hours drive to the north. Dr. Gladys's work galvanized local communities into joining the cause of protecting the gorillas, which have brought them an economic lifeline of ecotourism. The mountain gorilla population is the only one that has viable ecotourism, and it's the only population that's growing. So I believe that tourism has helped the mountain gorilla population to grow because people have an economic incentive to protect the gorillas and coexist with them. If a gorilla goes to their garden, they won't kill the gorilla because they know Tourists are coming to see these gorillas, and my children are able to go to school. Um, my children have jobs. We call them actually born-again poachers because they're earning more protecting rather than killing the animals. Gladys and her husband founded the NGO Conservation Through Public Health in 2002 to address how human disease threatens wildlife and to promote healthy local communities through food security, tree planting, and family planning initiatives. The COVID pandemic posed an existential threat to humans and gorillas alike, but the silver lining was an increased awareness of how inextricably linked the two are. Because of COVID, everyone understands that disease can be a big issue for people, public health, conservation, sustainable development, tourism. It can bring economies down just on standstill. So I would say that COVID, the COVID pandemic has helped people to really understand what we're doing. Dr. Gladys is among a group of experts developing a framework in a bid to prevent future pandemics through better understanding of how diseases move between species. And through her new memoir, Walking with Gorillas, she hopes to show a new generation of vets what can be achieved through passion and vision for the natural world. I hope that the book will inspire more people to become conservationists or women to achieve their dreams in spite of all the odds, because I've, my, I've been working in a very male-dominated environment. Um, people from Africa to get engaged in conservation, because there's not been much, many Africans engaged in conservation or owning it or leading conservation projects other than the governments. So I'm hoping that it will inspire many people to follow their dreams. Paul Barber, CGTN, London.
The threat level facing giant pandas in China has been downgraded from endangered to vulnerable as conservation efforts bring the total number in the wild to more than 1,800. The Giant Panda National Park in southwest China has been on the front line of the fight to save the animals. Guo Tianxi reports. A high altitude virgin forest and a typical habitat for giant pandas. Rangers patrol the mountains almost every day, monitoring and recording the distribution, frequency and quantity of plants and animals. We're following their trail to trace the pandas. This is the scent of a giant panda. It often leaves urine on the tree when it's in heat or marking its territory. You can still smell the unique smell of panda urine. The infrared camera attached to the panda's favorite tree records a middle-aged male. Opposite the tree is a narrow passageway, the perfect spot to catch hares. When the panda goes through this path, the brushes brush hair from its forelimbs, belly and backside. The hair is mainly measured for heavy metals to see if the habitat is suitable for them. This is a new approach to the study of wild pandas helped by the DNA in their hair. This place has at least 100 square kilometers of arrow bamboos, which is one of the most favorite type for giant pandas. But they can't digest the fiber in it, so they prefer the one or two year bamboo or the bamboo shoots like this. Pandas also leave their mark on the food. The giant panda has six fingers. It was sitting here and grabbed the bamboo and bit it off but it only ate the middle part, which is the tastiest for pandas. A full panda normally produces feces every half an hour, and that too has a bamboo-like fragrance. The giant panda national park Kuala area was established in the 1960s and covers more than 300 square kilometers. It's home to 335 giant pandas, accounting for about 20 percent of the total wild panda population. The endangered high-altitude plants and animals accompanying the giant pandas are also important parts of the alpine ecosystem. Guo Tianqi, CGTN, Pingwu, Sichuan Province. And finally, thousands of France's brainiest bookworms have attended a mass spellathon on the Champs Elysees. 1,800 desks were laid out on Paris's most famous boulevard. Organizers were hoping to break the world record for a dictation spelling competition with participants asked to transcribe a text as it was read to them. Well, the spelling bee created a lot of buzz. More than 50,000 people applied to take part. The headlines again. Oil prices rise after Saudi Arabia pledges to slash output by a million dot barrels a day. Label your deep fakes or face fines. The EU tells tech companies to signpost AI content to clamp down on disinformation. And claims and counterclaims. Russia says Ukraine's counteroffensive has begun as both sides talk up battlefield games. And that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. There's more on all of our stories at europe.cgtn.com. And do follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And you can go to CGTN Europe's channel on the Telegram app or scan the QR code on the screen to get stories and updates sent direct to your phone. Coming up next on CT10 is Africa Live, but we'll see you again, same time tomorrow, same place, from all the team here in London. Goodbye. Goodbye.